So that, that was a really interesting uh, panel discussion. And um, when I hear about animal models and connectivity, I hear parallel universes, but I don't hear crosstalk between them. Because, for example, Carol, in your work on um, intratemporal connectivity, how much of those changes are a function of what's coming down from the cortex, for example? So I think that there's much more interaction between the surface and what's down deep than I'm hearing among the panel members, and I want you to comment on that. I could sit down. That's probably for the general discussion. Yes. Um, All right. <laughs> So, okay. so, so any specific questions about this this okay. talk? Uh, and this is an important question that probably you can save for the general discussion. Sorry. Okay, so Jonathan, please. So yeah, I had one question for Rich, um, which I asked him an email, and he said his talk wasn't going to be long enough to answer it. So here's two more minutes. Um, no, but seriously, one of the things that I liked most about you know the, what you were showing for your last slide, the really high correlation between essentially age 11 and age 80 and presumably you know further down IQ is you know it really does sort of give us the notion that that's the kind of evidence we would need to sort of explain if there was anything over and above that, right? In other words, basically the whole residual approach. But the thing about it that it strikes me as particularly interesting is was if we were thinking of a cognitive reserve is something that is built up over the life course, then it really, you really should only be attempting to measure it using these sorts of models that do in, basically do incorporate sort of growth curves. Or am I missing something? No, I, I don't think you're missing something. And, uh, you know, Cheryl said it, and I agree. We really need lifespan studies to really understand what's happening and where people are coming from and going to. I just want to interject since uh, I don't see a lot of other people standing. Other people have looked at the same question uh, that Ian addressed. So Marcus Richards written a few papers on it from the British birth cohort. And there he is able to show over and above the childhood IQ influences of these later formative indicators on, on cognition in later life. So I, I think that these are open questions, but they, you really need the longitudinal studies to get at it. If I could go ahead and answer the question, sorry that was out of order, uh, about the connection between um, people who uh, are using animal models for aging, um, trying to, uh, to relate to uh, human aging issues. And um, I think where um, the animal models can inform um, our ideas for reserve or compensation in humans is that we can directly test um, uh, we can have hypotheses that, that can actually be um, so specific as to test one uh, form of compensation versus another, and we can actually prove ourselves either uh, get data that suggests that there are consist it's consistent with our ideas, say, of synaptic um, changes driving a lot of these uh, rearrangements in the brain. And um, so I think that w there does need to be more back and forth, and uh, what I would like to suggest is that more um, animal human um, uh, experiments proposed in grant proposals. This is really difficult to do. Um, I, I, there are program projects, but maybe linked R01s or something like that. And uh, in our inter institutional meetings for, um, for the McMite Foundation, we've started some of these animal human. Um, projects that, that are parallel and can feed off one another. And I think uh, we can be really good and critical of each other's experiments um, and, and going back and forth with the animals. So I, you know, I, 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 I get it. We, you know, I'm, I showed you the hippocampus, but I know that the hippocampus is connected to all these other regions. I showed you the inter interrhinal cortical input, but of course we need to be looking at more areas of the brain and that is what many of us are trying to do is um, to record from multiple brain sites at once. And not just in rodents, but try to bridge the gap and go and ask our questions in non-human primates. Um, they may be, we may get the same answers, but if we don't get the same answers, that will also be informative for directing therapeutics for, for humans. I guess you have noticed we're already in the general discussion, so uh, please bring your more fundamental questions that probably bridge across uh, the panel. Thank you all. For, hello. Thank you all for really wonderful and inspiring uh, presentations. I was surprised that not much was discussed about actual brain volume 
So I thought, what is the likelihood or the importance of measuring the rate of change of brain volume as measure of reserve? Because we know there is a very strong correlation between volume and cognitive performance. Um, I think I uh, probably can uh, uh, take on this question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, measures of brain volume are important, the regional brain volumes. Uh, we, it's a good example where we should look at the translational harmonization of animal and human studies because when we measure brain shrinkage, we need to know what actually it means and there's some indication from animal studies that is probably accounted mostly by shrinkage of neuropeel. Um, so that's, uh, that's maybe a good indicator uh, connecting the plasticity since uh, it's predicated on uh, changes in the dendritic spines and uh, dendritic arborization. Volume may indicate that aspect, but it's just one part of the picture. We need to sort of bring together different modalities. Uh, and we need to connect those modalities, animal and human studies, because uh, what is the connection, for example, between uh, changes in network configuration and changes in actual hardware that underlies it? We don't know. We need multi-occasion longitudinal studies to answer this question and know what are the lead-lag relationship among those different indicators. So, uh, yes, I mean, it's important, but it's just one part of the picture. Just a follow-up of your answer. I'm reading that there are interventions that can either slow the rate of volume loss or even reverse it. So this is also just how the volume responds to intervention. Would this be a good a potential measure of reserve? It, I mean, the, the fact that you can change one predictor of uh, reserve, for example, doesn't mean that you will affect reserve because what you may do, you may actually disengage this predictor from reserve. It will be less powerful predictor once you manipulate it. It's not necessarily will be translated into change in reserve. Uh, the point that uh, was made a couple of times, we need to look at the lifespan uh, perspective. So greater volume to begin with may affect reserve. Uh, slowing down uh, volume change uh, may be beneficial, but it doesn't necessarily affect reserve that's already there. Yeah, uh, say something? Yeah, yeah, I was a little confused by a, a statement at the end, uh, Rich, and I'm wondering about how the panel regards it. Um, I thought that you said that uh, the Scottish study with that long correlation uh, from age 11 to older age uh, suggested that we need to distinguish IQ from reserve as perhaps a confounder of reserve, but isn't the brain we were born with an element of reserve as other peoples have, have been defined it? I'm not sure I understood correctly. Go for it, Rich. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And, um, uh, this comes down to fundamental definitions of what is reserve, what is compensation, what are all these different things, and, and uh, we need concrete definitions as a field to help move these things forward. Uh, I have my own personal view on where IQ stands relative to these other concepts, and I'll happily talk about it with you in the social hour tonight. <laughs> uh. So in the models were in the animal, so this is mainly directed to Carol, but also applies to the next session, where you have animals, some when they get old, they become cognitively impaired, some not. Uh, we know in, in MCI and Alzheimer's disease, neurons degenerate, and Carol pointed out there seems to be increased excitability of certain neural networks in the cognitive, if I'm understanding, in the cognitively impaired. So, have studies been done uh, seeing whether cognitively impaired animals, neurons are more vulnerable to excitotoxicity, more vulnerable to metabolic stress, which we think, you know, there's reduced glucose utilization and so on. It seems like uh, this would be a good model to bridge between the functionality of the networks and degeneration of neurons. 
Yeah. So this is probably a better question for Michaela, but uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> but we can raise it again in her session. But uh, the the idea that the uh, so in the animal model that I use and the animal animals that uh, uh, are the Fisher three four four that I use that are like twenty five to 28 months, most of those animals have cognitive impairments compared to younger animals. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like this, yeah. whereas Michaela's animals have a, a sort of a, a, a lifespan, even though they're the same age, they, they live longer. And so at um, the quote old age, there, there tends to be more uh, separation. And so you can kind of prune these off. And we can even do that in, in our fishers as well if we go younger and, and, and so forth. And so I, I think your point is a strong one that we, uh, and Michaela's made really good use of this in, in her work and as has Peter, to, to separate these animals out to see what is still really intact. Um, and it would be re very, very nice to know when that starts to go wrong or whether um, it doesn't in these animals. Uh, so I, I think uh, until very late. And so the, the factors that are guiding whether what the threshold is for converting to, say, hyperexcitability and CA3 would be uh, really, really important. Maybe um, they're, you know, they're really resistant to this phenotypic change in GABAergic neurons. You know, if you, if you have the same number of neurons, but they're switching chemical transmitters on you from being uh, inhibitory to not, I mean, that, that's a, a serious change. And maybe those kinds of switches um, are what's determining it. And, and your metabolic factors are going to be related to that, I'm sure. Yeah, this question originally was for uh, Carol, but uh, could be for anyone in the panel. So my question was related to the fact that, you know, a number of these studies that have been talked about so far, and we'll go further later, you know, are sort of neuron-centric. But obviously, neurons in the central nervous system are in a niche of, of other glial interactions. You know, and there's lots of work, our lab, many other labs, Phil Lanfield's lab, um, that have been focusing on, like, the bioenergetics of the astrocytes, the microglia, the oligodendrocytes. Um, and obviously, microglia are important in um, you know, controlling dendrite number, synapse number, things like that. So I was just wondering, you know, with that context, um, what were your thoughts in terms of, you know, how that impacts your studies? I completely confess I've been focusing on neurons my whole academic career, so <laughs> of 45 years plus. So, and the comment is really well taken, and, and um, you'll be glad, Paula, that I am actually, with my monkey studies, because I have serial section brains and, and, and so forth, I'm just starting a collaboration with uh, uh, somebody at UCLA whose name I'm blocking on right now, who has these wonderful glia markers and um, gene guns to actually um, go in and, and mark you know, oligodendroglia versus microglia versus astrocytes. And we're going to have um, the answer maybe in three years, I guess, <laughs> about um, the contributions that these might be making to uh, cognition and so on. But I, I, the point is well taken. Yeah. Thank you. I would just interject. I mean, we, it's, it's not just animal studies that have this. In human studies, we, we have such a, a wealth of uh, measurements now that we can make with imaging, uh, just straight with MRI and now with PET. Uh, and, and it's, it's going to be the same issue of how to integrate all these multimodal, multimodal data in a way that's meaningful uh, and try to pick out the relationships that, that uh, become important. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, a very strong challenge because in any small microsphere, you can see things, but you have to relate them across the different domains. Yeah, quick interjection to follow up on this very important point, I think. Uh, the, the bioenergetics is just an elephant in the room that we're not talking about, but it may be the core reason for all those changes happening. That. Uh, actually reduction in available energy may affect all these changes on the neuronal levels and the network level everywhere. And we need really to assess what's happening in bioenergetics with age and whether it's driving all those changes. And um, easier said than done, but I think it should be done. Next uh, trade. 
Okay, so this, this question started with um, uh, this 1992 data that Yakov was showing, but then feeds right into this discussion here. <clears throat> so aging is a multidimensional um, process, and we now have many different measurements. And Can in you our talk data, into the microphone a little bit more? Oh, sorry. Um, so aging is this multidimensional process, and we now have many different measurements that we can use. And in our data, you can basically pick any set of um, neurodegenerative changes. So we have measurements of amyloid, uh, white matter diffusivity, functional connectivity, hippocampal volume, cortical thickness, et cetera. And if somebody has a pair of those, they're much more likely to decline over time than somebody who has only one. So for any given level of cognitive severity, you could pick any one of these uh, pathologies. We have this habit, a uh, simplifying habit, of looking at these one at a time. So if you pick any one, then you might see a proxy like education or socioeconomic status. Those individuals will have lower um, pathology for that particular marker. But if those people are more likely to have more than one, then maybe what we're talking about when we talk about reserve is comorbidity, essentially. Right. I, so th I, I would lump that. I, I, I think where I would put that is, um, first of all, should we differentiate between normal cognitive, normal brain aging, or, or call that a pathology, or lump that together with, uh, you know, AD-related, like uh, now we can measure um, um, A, beta, and tau. Uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, we really have to, we, we have to get beyond one measure volume, uh, amyloid burden, tau burden, and, and try to integrate all of these together. Uh, you know, it's my belief that, and we're trying to do that, even after accounting for all of these things that we can measure, diffusivity and uh, cortical thickness and uh, et cetera, white matter hyperintensities, that there's still individual variability in the outcome over and above that. But you're right. I mean, the, the other question as well, uh, are we fully accounting for all of the um, various things that can influence the brain changes and the pathologic changes that can influence cognition before we talk about the moderators of them. And you know, unfortunately, that's, or fortunately, that's, it's cool that we have all of these. There are people with the data. We need more, and we need longitudinal data, but we're in a position to start to really ask those questions. Uh, you know, and, 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 and then the other thing that's really important is, especially given uh, Rich's um, um, cautioning us not to lump all of these different formative indicators. I think you have to sort of ask this question for a lot of these different um, um, life exposures separately first, because they might they might have distinct effects on on brain maintenance, and they might have totally alternate effects on on uh, cognitive reserve or network maintenance, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the combinations of them could be crucial. So we're not talking about a simple question here, but I think what's really cool is that we really have a lot of good measures that with thoughtfulness uh, we could start to try to pull together uh, to, to more, more directly address the question you're asking. Uh, thank you guys very much for such a stimulating conversation. I guess my question started with Rich and your, your refusal to answer what IQ was, and then also based on uh, Yaakov and Cheryl's comments. I think if one of the most important things that could come out of this conference is really nail down some of our definitions. Like, what do we mean by IQ? I mean, is IQ genetics? Is it, you know, productivity? Is it uh, education? What is education? I, Jennifer Manley's here, and she could debate that as well. And so, should there be a different, more close um, measure of reserve rather than a proxy of reserve? And something that you said, Yaakov, made me think, is it really brain efficiency? You know, is there a combination of brain networks and cognitive function that can really come together and that becomes our real measure of uh, reserve? And I was thinking Rhoda's question earlier about are there more sensitive ways? I mean, we just started um, uh, collecting data on a digital pen. Now, is that a way in which we can really efficiently measure the speed and efficiency at which people problem solve, make decisions, just even in a simple task? I hope we can come away kind of inspired by coming up with even newer ways of trying to uh, tackle this problem, because I agree with you, uh, with all of you, that it's pretty complex.
Oh, I, I, I see Rich is sort. Do you want to say something, Rich? <laughs> uh, I, I will say um, <clears throat> there's a. There's, so there's, there's one important lesson that we need to remember, which is uh, the fallacy of concreteness, or also known as uh, reification. So we, don't, we have to remember that the, the, that, that the map is not the territory, right? We have, when we have measures of things, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the thing. And I think that could be part of the problem that we get in with IQ. IQ is just one thing that the brain does. The brain does lots of different things. Right. And, uh, and for a well-functioning brain, may, maybe you need a well-functioning brain to develop a high IQ and have success in, in society. Um, and whatever it is that causes that may also cause resistance to pathology when it shows up. I think it gets a little bit confused uh, and is actually more challenging to study in the context of Alzheimer's disease and, and, and slow burning uh, pathologies. And I do think that uh, extending the reserve concept to other uh, brain diseases or brain accidents, strokes, um, uh, what is it? Uh, chemo brain, uh, head injury, post uh, operative cognitive dysfunction, those areas. If the reserve concept is going to work, it's got to work in multiple areas, not just in a in a, in a disease where there could be decades of uh, cognitive decline that precedes uh, you're seeing a patient. So um, that's the IQ answer. You want to add? Yeah. I'll, I'll add. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Rich is saying. IQ is a, a broad concept. Right. You know, I think the way Ian Deary uses it is sort of a marker of where people are at at age 11, whatever that is. And I, I think what he often tries to suggest is n n these other life exposures don't contribute over and above that, which uh, I, don't, I don't particularly agree. And I don't think he agrees with that anymore, at least, at least to my face. Uh, um, but um, I, I think the other thing that you're s suggesting is, is interesting. It's that, and, I, and I, I, I said it very quickly when I was speaking, We've been focusing on imaging measures um, um, and, we, and, and sort of our clinical readout. But if we're going to think about um, processing differences, are people approaching tasks differently? Mm -hmm. are they, is there something about flexibility in problem solving? Uh, what is co uh, uh, compensation? means activating extra areas, but what we really think that activating extra areas is a different approach, yes. right? Using different resources to, so I, I think there's a, a, a lot of room for very good, carefully designed cognitive experimental work. So the pen, what you're saying with the pen is that yeah. that's a way of getting at the process through which someone is really trying to do that. Yeah, uh, You know, I'm working with a graduate student who, you know, it's a very simple question, but it's really hard to answer. Can you create tasks that measure flexibility in problem solving. Yes. Uh, uh, and I, I think going after these in a cognitive experimental way, I think is going to be very useful as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, those some in the back people. Um, so uh, first out, uh, you know, thank you for the great uh, presentation and also the discussion. So I would like to follow up on one uh, question uh, briefly touched uh, at the end of uh, Carol's talk about you know how to longitudinally follow up this uh, you know cognitive reserve uh, or change during the aging process. Seems it's clear that in order to understand the underlying mechanism you know, why some people keep the reserve but others get declined, we got to know when this change starts, especially, for example, in animal studies. So um, I wonder what's the thought or uh, the field stands now from the panel, you know, what are the toolbox are available? What are toolbox the field need to develop? And what's the future directions? How to uh, tackle this very critical question to address this uh, cognitive uh, concern? So uh, one approach that we're taking now is to, it's, it's, it's not IQ, but it's uh, rats that solve problems really, really well, um, poorly, or are average for their age, and look at different ages. So what we're doing is identifying groups of animals that are cognitively gifted, average, or low for young, middle-aged, and, and older, older animals, and then we're doing um, uh, uh, act, 
activity, uh, uh, genetic uh, activity marker studies to see whether the networks that are activated by um, behaviors are stable, more stable in the um, gifted <laughs> um, uh, animals of each age group, and we're doing uh, deep sequencing um, using laser capture micro dissection of specific cell types um, in the hippocampus, in frontal cortex, and in torrinal cortex, and so forth, to see whether we can see, you know, gene programs uh, that are pushing the system towards more efficiency or effectiveness, and so forth. So that's one approach we've taken. Um, but it would be wonderful if we had non-invasive ways of monitoring animals across their entire lifespan. We do have the opportunity to do that um, in, in humans, but we live so long, um, the experimenters will uh, sort of not be around when the experiment's done. But uh, uh, so it is possible to do this in animals, and uh, I, we are doing, you know, uh, using seven Tesla um, MRIs and so forth to try to get at, um, you know, doing DTI, structural, all that kind of thing across the lifespan. We're also engaging in that. But I don't know what the beth best method will be, and it's all, certainly not going to be one. This is something that Jakob <laughs> brought up. It's not going to be one way. We need convergent ways to do that across the lifespan. I'd like to hear, do you have ideas for? For, for this, solving this problem? No, no, that's, you know, what, what I think is, uh, you know, we have a lot of those, uh, when you're doing the animal studies, you know, sometimes you know, take down the mice, do the pathology. So it seems to me is the functional analysis you mentioned a few on um, that, is just how to follow up, you know, from a young animal to the aged animals continuously, not in an invasive way. Yeah. Uh, the functional readout, uh, you know, will be critical here. Of yeah. course, the, the difficulty is how to do it, what kind of this one. And uh, we are trying to do now this, uh, this longitudinal in vivo, uh, uh, you know, uh, intracellular recording, not a detailed intracellular recording. So now for animal studies, for mice specifically, which we are trying to push about 10 months follow up, multiple measures in, within the same animal. So they, we will know the data so. Wow. <laughs> okay, Bill, please, and next to. Uh, Thanks again for a really interesting uh, set of talks. Uh, two thoughts. One is I have to say, I guess I'm more in the Ian Deary camp. Um, I think IQ is an imperfect construct, but so, is all the, so are all the other variables that we, that we use. But I think, and you know, I guess it remains to be proven that um, although other exposures may have an impact, that it's small relative to IQ, and that the IQ that you have from young adulthood is, I think, what's really going to account for the large majority of the, of the variants here. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that I think um, the word genes was mentioned once by one of the panel members, and since the constructs that are being, uh, that are being talked about all the brain measures and cognition are largely, or to a very large extent, probably the majority of the variants, is due to genes. I, I think we need to incorporate uh, genetics into um, the study of cognitive reserve if we're going to really fully understand it, which makes an already complicated uh, thing that much more complicated. But, but I really think it's, it's an important piece of the puzzle. Can I just comment that that's exactly what we're trying to do in identifying these um, uh, animals of different cognitive uh, levels, capabilities. We're trying to get at the genes that might be responsible, the pathways, the molecular pathways that might be responsible for this. So, I mean, it's a small start, but. I wanted to go back to something that ya you can't hear me? Okay, I'll get closer. Um, I wanted to get back to something that Yaakov mentioned, because I think it's really key to thinking about the cognitive reserve definitions and issues as well, and that is that we don't know in cross-sectional studies who's going to go on to develop pathology. And when we talk about reserve you know, and brain changes and cognitive changes, to what extent are those being driven by preclinical disease? And I think it's really going to be critical to have a better understanding of the extent to which some of these changes in relationships are driven by preclinical impending disease. I know in our work, 
when we look at relationships, um, there are some that hold even in people who remain cognitively normal, but many of them go away as soon as we do the longitudinal follow-ups and then retrospectively exclude those people from analyses. So I, I wanted to make that point now. I think it'll probably come up again in the next session. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you uh, in a lot of ways. I, even if you leave out Alzheimer's disease, just talk about normal aging, I, I think your, your points are well taken. And, it's, it's really a problem with the kind of cross-sectional and sectional analyses we do. So, uh, for example, I have one study where we have people from 20 through 80, and we screen them very, very carefully to get into the study. And uh, Mick Rugg was visiting, and he, he said, I mean, he's not the first person to say, but he said it really nicely. He says, how do we know which, what percentage of the 20-year-olds that are in our study would meet entry criteria at age 80? Uh, so that, that, I think that sort of wraps up what you're, you're, yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Uh, it, so that's a very cool way to go back and re retrospectively uh, uh, pull out people. But I, I think we're going to need very difficult longitudinal studies now. I, and, and I think it's important to start young because I think the processes that were, that, that all, like the age-related, aging-related processes that we're talking about are already beginning to happen, you know, from 20 to 30, 20 to 25. So there is an opportunity for maybe five, 10 years that'll give us some, some interesting and... and, and uh, so, so maybe one of the things we need to do, for example, is the ABCD study that's going on, you know, in young development and the Philadelphia neuropsychiatric cohort, you know, somebody will need to follow those cohorts throughout their lives yeah. because they're being really, I think a lot's been done with the perinatal collaborative project, for example. Okay, last question, please. Um, I just have two quick questions. The first one is for Carol. Um, I was curious, um, I wasn't really quite convinced by your data that why we should be studying this in animal models. I mean, you show that the fact that these animals do not get uh, Alzheimer's, for me, is convincing. It's more suggesting that, you know, their aging process is different, their brain aging process is different. And why, other than the fact that we can better manipulate them and understand the molecular process, you know, if none of it translates to humans, why are we still focusing on these animal models? Should we be focusing more on finding better methods of studying this process in humans? Um, the second question is actually for Rich. When you showed the, uh, the definition of, of reserve originally came from studying it in, I guess, in humans where there's patients who get Alzheimer's or pathology, but they don't actually develop the cognitive uh, deficits as much. Um, so, but they seems like there were only like few people. So are these, is this a really outlier concept that we're trying to study or is this part of normal aging? Like how do we know what we're studying is actually a part of normal, a part of the normal aging process? So quick um, answers to these questions. So go ahead. Animals are important because you, um, so studying animal models, we've shown that there are correspondences between species and uh, that uh, apply to humans. So I'm quite confident that similar things are going on during normative aging. There's something that is superimposed on the normative process um, in humans that allows it to develop AD. Thank you for that question. And I know by your question that my talk was a success because that's exactly the question I wanted you to think about. So let's thank the, the panel and this session speakers.